Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's uh, like we said, the second to last uh, talk of this series, and I think it's, it's going to end nicely for everybody. Um, what we've been building to is to actually tell you about the application of arts on a sort of bigger and broader scale and how we can start um, using them for management. Um, if you want to go ahead and next slide. So we've kind of touched very briefly upon, well, not very briefly, we've touched uh, over a number of subjects across the different webinars from hormone induction versus natural breeding um, to sort of, uh, yeah, hormone induction of gametes in, in order to retrieve these and then the analysis and the quality, um, looking at the quality of the gametes retrieved after hormonal induction. But basically all of this has been leading up to um, to the final thing, which is gamete storage. Thank you, Rose. Um, and obviously biobanking or long-term cryopreservation of, of sperm in the case of amphibians. Um, and more and more now also looking at, at um, banking cell lines in order to then culture them later is, is the way that we're trying to approach um, the the storage of, of uh, genetics in the long term for for preservation of species right across both captive and wild populations where necessary next slide so i won't spend too much time uh, rose touched on this last webinar too it's one of the prime examples if not the best example of of the use of arts and incorporation into the management of an, a critically endangered species is the black-footed ferret and everything that has been achieved um, in terms of, of using arts as a genetic management tool and a rescue tool for this species. Um, next slide. So basically what we're looking at is, like I said, is understanding that in order to preserve genetic diversity across time, the longer the time, the, the more individuals we're gonna have to bring in potentially from, from the wild to, to uh, bolster our captive populations or the genetics of our captive populations. And in, in light of not wanting to retrieve um, live whole animals from the wild, then we're gonna have to find other ways to, to collect this genetic representation without actually affecting populations in the wild potentially, right? And so obviously the, the greater number of individuals that you have represented, the higher the likelihood you will have of actually preserving um, your genetic diversity for those populations into, into the long-term, into the future. Next slide. Um, so Klula and Klula kind of touched on this in, not kind of touched on this in a, in a review paper back in 2006. And if we look at um, basically what we can do with sperm and um, cells in particular, maybe not eggs and embryos at the stage yet, but um, those that are frozen um, and stored, we can sell, use those cell lines for culture and bring back, potentially employ some, some more advanced arts later to actually try and incorporate genetics that way from both the maternal and the male lineage. Or we can use um, frozen sperm to assist with things like artificial insemination or IVF, um, embryo transfer, and even cloning as well. And the ultimate goal there is obviously to provide to, pr to pr produce live offspring for the purpose of either returning genetic diversity to these populations, um, halting the chances of extinction, or even bringing back a species um, in the case of any of ones that have that have gone extinct. So um, next slide. Um, the, and there's an increasing body of literature coming out that's dealing with the, the, the logistics of this. And obviously there's, there's information out there, but um, Rose kind of provided, is providing here a, an example of, of a, good, a good place to start if you're starting to think about how you're going to um, either manage or rescue uh, populations that have are small and may have become inbred, and looking at what um, how to manage those populations genetically in order to rescue them from 
from um, inbreeding by uh, incorporating or, or manipulating that gene flow without actually going too far and, and looking at also the potential downfalls of, out, of extreme outbreeding as well. But um, this is a good paper to, to probably sort of sink your teeth in initially if you're, you're looking to, to start thinking about these, these questions. Next slide. So I've kind of sped through this introduction because I feel like Rose touched on this last, last webinar. And so the point of this, um, this talk is going to be, she's going to highlight and also Cecilia is, has provided a, a recording of examples um, where, we, where, where we've applied this in the field in order to bring genetics back into captive populations. And this is obviously important in particular in species that are endangered. And so Rose is gonna talk about some of her PhD work, which was with Latoria Ray and Latoria Felix, which is using cryopreserved sperm to produce live offspring and, and look at how they develop later on. And Cecilia then touches on some of the stuff that she did for her PhD as well back in, the, in 2013, 14, which is with two species, um, which is the Southern Rocky Mountain Boreal Toad and an actress Boris Boris and uh, the Mississippi Gopher Frog with the Bates Sivosa. And um, looking at how you can go into the field and collect sperm from these animals and bring it back into a captive setting and actually use it to sort of enhance the genetics of those captive populations. Thanks, Nat. Um, so hopefully that gives a good background to sort of why we have been doing these projects, gives a bit of background into what, what the rationale for doing these sorts of projects is. So I wanted to give everybody a bit of a example of a project that I was recently involved in with a bunch of people and a bunch of collaborations where we responded to a a, a fire basically many of you may have heard about the fires in Australia recently and try and preserve some of the genetics from um, fire affected frogs um, and and later in the talk we'll also have um, Dr Simon Clulo and he'll give a different example where it's a bit more um, proactive instead of reactive so hopefully we'll give you guys a good range of um, you know reasons to do things when to do things and um, like thinking about logistics throughout the whole thing. So when I first sat down to make slides about this project, um, I Googled climate change and coincidentally, this came up, the IPCC report had just come out and probably many of you have heard about that and how that there really is a need to put a stop to some of these um, climate change problems because otherwise it's just going to get worse and worse and unfortunately that means that news articles like this are likely to become more regular, more frequent and so this is a real headline from the 2019-2020 megafires in Australia. Um, yeah it was, it was pretty horrible. So what we did was reactive. It was reacting to this, this disaster. And so as Nat mentioned during my PhD, I did a bit of work um, on working up protocols for um, cryopreserving sperm from Latoria aurea, which is an endangered species on the East Coast of Australia. Um, and another paper, which I haven't been able to publish yet, but watch this space, um, applied the protocol from that to some other common species, which I've pictured down here in the left. Um, and so what we were able to see was that, you know, something that is uh, able to be applied across different species and with, you know, results that are, we we're able to retain some motility post-thaw after cryopreserving the sperm of these species. And so that was really important. Um, for this work, that we knew we had a protocol that would hopefully help us cryopreserve sperm of some of these species that we hadn't worked with before. So this is an example of one of the field sites that had been affected by fire. Um, and 
we targeted a wide range of frog species in the field. Um, and this, these are some photos of some of the species that we were targeting and trying to catch after the fire to preserve genetics from. Um, we targeted quite a few, some a little bit more special than others. This is a favorite species of mine from the project. Um, and so, because we'd done a lot of this work in the lab before, we really had to think about the logistics of transferring this from ex situ to in situ. And so we normally would use a program, programmable controlled freezer in the lab. Um, but in this case, we needed to replicate the freezing rate in the field that we knew would help freeze the sperm. And we came up with this little device here, which is just a regular, I think it's 50 or 100 mil tube. Um, and we poked some holes in the top and we put the straws into the, um, into the holes and the, the, the container is actually filled with sand, which helps insulate the straws. And we were able to achieve a freezing rate close to what we achieved in, in, in the lab with the programmable freezer. Um, so then we would lower this into a dry shipper um, and keep it there for about half an hour to achieve that cooling rate. And uh, this was all um, stuff that we had developed in the lab. So we had an honors student back in 2016, Leslie Wong, who worked up a bunch of different um, protocols and figured out what freezing rates were useful, um, what cryoprotectants were useful um, in some similar species that we were targeting in this project. And then Darcy Brett, who's a current honors student at um, University of Newcastle, she was the one who worked up this um, sand apparatus that was able to replicate Leslie's freezing rates. So that's how we approached the problem of transferring these technologies into the field. And what this looked like ultimately was a whole bunch of equipment in the car. Um, we're currently sitting on the side of a road and this drops off very steeply into a ditch the way that I'm facing. We're looking at a microscope there that's plugged into a power cell that we brought with us. We had to charge it up ahead of time. There's no like electrical power points out in the bush. Um, so we had to bring everything with us and things ultimately go wrong. Like you forget to bring the cover slips or the pets or whatever. So that, that all of that, we had to deal with that as it went. Um, but ultimately we were able to bring this lab into the field and, that's my lab right there, my, my field lab. <laughs> and this sort of evolved over time. This is a powered campsite. So in this case, we had access to power. We didn't need the little, the little power cell that we brought with us. So depending on where our field sites were, we, if we were closer to civilization, we could um, have a bit more of a high-tech lab. And then at one point we were lucky enough to be in a cabin so we upgraded even more. We even had two microscopes and an extra pair of hands. Um, so this was actually progression over time during this project as well, so this is in order. And so, like I said before, we targeted 10 species during this grant. Um, we were able to collect over a hundred individuals. And from those individuals, we collected over 400 straws of genetic material from 15 locations down the East Coast of Australia. Breaking it down, this is the number of males per species. Some we had more success finding than others. Um, and they, these straws are stored at the Taronga Cryodiversity Bank in Sydney. Um, these, Taronga was collaborative with this project with us. And uh, watch this space. We haven't done a lot of analysis on the quality control straws at this point, but we, we plan to do that in the near future. This was a very big project. It involved a lot of people. So I'm just trying to get across like the logistics that you need to think about when approaching a project like this. And if anybody's thinking about doing anything like this, please feel free to reach out. Any of us would be happy to help out. Um, yeah, so I haven't gone deeply into the protocols that we use during this tri these trips. Um, just more trying to give an idea of what a trip like this looks like. Um, so here's, all of the collaborators from all of the different institutions. 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Cecilia Langhorn and I'm going to share with you today some work I did during my PhD on arts and the boreal toad, uh, specifically um, investigating the feasibility of sperm collection and cryopreservation in the field uh, to determine whether we could take our hormone induction and sperm cryopreservation protocols that we had developed and optimised in the lab into the field to collect and freeze sperm from wild toads. Um, this work was part of a three-year collaboration between Mississippi State University, where we were based, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and it was funded through Memphis Zoo's Conservation Action Network Awards and IMLS. The target species uh, for the study was the boreal toad. Um, this is a subspecies of the more widespread western toad, and is typically found in the high alpine elevation zones between 6,500 to 12,000 feet, within the federal and state protected areas of the Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, widespread chytrid fungus, along with environmental pressures, have resulted in a number of small, fragmented populations, such as the southern Rocky Mountain boreal toad, which has suffered significant declines since the 1970s. And as a result of these declines, Colorado Parks and Wildlife established a substantial captive breeding colony at the Native Aquatic Species Restoration Facility, or NASRIF, as I'll refer to it from now on, uh, based in Alamosa, Colorado. The hatchery focuses specifically on captive propagation of threatened, endangered or declining aquatic and amphibian species and has been actively involved in southern Rocky Mountain boreal toad restoration efforts for over 20 years. Um, NASRIF houses over 700 boreal toads, uh, which are maintained in genetically distinct groups. Uh, reproductive output from each breeding population can vary markedly each year and inconsistent breeding together with an ageing population could compromise the breeding programme through the loss of valuable founder individuals. But the removal of individuals from the wild for genetic augmentation of the colony could detrimentally impact their free living counterparts. Therefore, the ability of a conservation breeding programme such as NASRIF to augment the carrying capacity and genetic diversity of a captive population without influencing the demographics of the wild population would be highly advantageous. So we wanted to validate the application of sperm induction, collection and storage techniques in the wild and to determine whether these techniques could potentially be used as a means to enhance the captive population through the integration of wild sperm by artificial fertilisation using um, eggs from females housed at Nazareth. Um, there were two main steps to consider in designing these field experiments. Um, firstly, it was very important that we had previously established gamete collection, storage and artificial fertilisation techniques. Um, we had a research colony of boreal toads housed at uh, Mississippi State, where we had previously run an extensive hormone trial to develop and refine a spermiation protocol. Um, we established... Um, that uh, the hormone HCG at a dose of 10 IUs per gram initiated the best spermiation response. So um, this chart shows average sperm production of uh, 21 toads over a 24-hour collection period following hormone administration. The grey area indicates the peak sperm response, which was between 3 to 5 hours, and we also analysed motility, which was around 80% across all time points. And this information provided a, a time frame for field work. So we knew that if we could collect samples for several hours, up to five hours, then we should secure optimal sperm samples. We also explored the effect of refrigeration uh, of boreal toad sperm on motility parameters. Uh, samples were maintained at five degrees over two weeks and motility um, was analysed daily. So this chart on the right um, shows... Uh, the proportion of samples retaining motility over 14 days, represented by the bars, and the average percentage motility is shown by the line. Um, so we found that boreal toad sperm is highly resilient to cold storage, maintaining motility up to 14 days, uh, albeit at a significantly reduced motility compared to um, the day one sample. 100% um, of samples maintain motility up to day five, um, by which time um, motility declined to around 50%. And by day 14, 48% of samples exhibited an average motility of um, 28%. So um, these experiments um, provided information 
Um, so we knew that we would be able to collect sperm samples and keep them in cold storage um, until they could be analysed and used for uh, cryopreservation or artificial fertilisation. Um, we'd also developed a two-step slow-rate sperm cryopreservation protocol, uh, which very handily required uh, relatively basic and portable equipment, which could be applied in the field. So briefly, spermic urine samples were extended one-to-one -one in cryoprotectant containing 10% DMFA and 10% tree hillows and equilibrated at 4 degrees for 10 minutes before being loaded into freezing straws and held in liquid nitrogen vapour for a further 10 minutes. Um, straws are then plunged into liquid nitrogen and stored. Uh, in the lab, the samples are stored in cryotanks at minus 196 um, but in the field, samples can temporarily be maintained in a dry shipper um, that holds them at minus 80. Finally, um, with regards to females, our postdoc Natalie Kalatayud had developed a hormone regimen for ovulation and egg release. Uh, females could be induced to ovulate by a priming dose of um, 3.7 IUs per gram HCG on day one and then again on day four followed 24 hours later by an ovulatory dose of 3.7 IUs per gram HCG and 0.4 milligrams per gram of uh, LHRH, with egg release uh, occurring around 12 hours later. Artificial fertilisation is relatively straightforward. Um, eggs are expressed into a dish, uh, around 100 eggs per dish, and sperm added at a concentration of around 100,000, and, and eggs and sperm are left for a five-minute dry fertilisation period before flooding the dish and then developmental um, stages recorded thereafter. So with all our protocols established, um, the next step in the process was engaging with local authorities and field biologists to figure out the logistics of a field expedition. It's obviously important to be aware of any collection permits that may be required and local knowledge um, was key to locating field sites and determining accessibility um, with regards to the type of equipment that we could take with us. So we were really lucky to have the support and assistance of Colorado Parks and Wildlife, who kindly lent us their biologists to assist in the field and help us plan out the logistics according to the particular field site. Um, for example, if a um, field site is accessible on foot only, um, limited equipment um, could be brought in. So only a very basic field kit would be uh, required for sperm collection and uh, cold storage on site um, with sperm analysis and cryopreservation happening later in the lab. Alternatively, if our field site was accessible with a vehicle, then we could utilise a mobile lab unit, which would allow for more um, specialised equipment, including a generator powered microscope, liquid nitrogen and other sperm cryopreservation equipment and charge dry shipper for sample storage. And this would enable us to analyse and process samples for cryopreservation on site. So our first trip was uh, more of a recce, just to see if we could find some toads and collect sperm. Our field site was fairly remote, so we were quite limited in what we could carry and we didn't have access to a mobile lab on this trip. So this was strictly sperm collection and cold storage. So armed with our protocols and a very basic field kit of a cooler and some hormones, collecting tubes and other paraphernalia associated with um, spermic urine collections, we headed into the hills to see if we could locate toads, induce spermiation and maintain viable samples for several hours following collection. So we spent a day roaming around the Rocky Mountains, which was not unpleasant, <laughs> with a very helpful Colorado Parks and Wildlife biologist who helped us locate um, the breeding ponds. We limited our collection window to five hours, um, which was all daylight would permit, but as we knew from our spermiation um, protocol, this should give us plenty of time to take advantage of pe peak sperm production. We found uh, seven males on this expedition and collected uh, samples and uh, returned to a temporary lab set up. Um, because of biosecurity, it, it wasn't possible to analyze our sperm samples back at Nazareth um, because we, we couldn't take them into uh, the biosecure facility. So our temporary lab was actually um, a pretty grubby motel in the nearest town where we spent the entire night analyzing sperm samples, with concentration and motility parameters. And since we had three time point collections for each 
of the males. <laughs> it was a lot of samples and only one microscope. So it took us between six to 12 hours following collection to um, get all the samples analyzed. So these are the results of our first attempts in the field. Um, and this chart is a male response to hormone treatment at each of the collection time points. The zero hour time point um, was the initial urine sample taken prior to hormone administration. And as you can see, uh, we had one pesky male with sperm in his time zero sample, which we, we, hadn't, um, we hadn't had that before in our lab studies. Um, this male um, then did not respond to hormone treatment. Um, no sperm was present in, in any of the subsequent samples from this male. Um, so it's possible that he had just recently mated. Um, if we'd been able to analyze the sample at the time, then we would have excluded this male uh, from the study. We, we wouldn't have collected any more uh, samples from him. But um, anyway, other than that, there was a good response rate with all six remaining males producing sperm at two and three hours post-hormone administration and five out of six males producing sperm at the five hour time point. Um, sperm concentration here in the middle uh, was an average around 1.5 million uh, per mil across the collection period, which was similar to what we'd observed in our captive population. And motility was between 40 to 60 percent, with the proportion exhibiting forward motility between 20 to 30 percent, um, uh, 20 to 35 percent. Sorry, this was much lower than we'd seen in our lab studies, um, which was on average around 80 percent. Um, so it's perhaps um, explained by an inefficient cooler. Um, I, I think perhaps samples were not maintained at a consistently cool temperature in the field. It was a warm day and our cool packs didn't remain as cold as we would have liked. And since the samples were stored like this for up to 12 hours prior to analysis, it's likely that this had a detrimental effect on the sperm quality. But this was a valuable lesson to invest in a decent cooler for next time and so that's what we did the following year. Um, so the next couple of breeding seasons we stepped it up a notch and we deployed our university truck into the field which we'd converted into a mobile lab. We brought along our fancy new cooler with Hobo data logger attachment to monitor temperature and this time we camped out in the field in order to maximize our time and reduce the amount of time between sample collection and analysis and this also allowed us to crowd preserve samples on site. Um, this was all made possible through our excellent guide and Colorado Parks and Wildlife Biologist, Kevin Thompson, who volunteered his time, his portable generator and his tent, which he even put up for us. <laughs> um, so without, without his help, then this, this would not have been possible. Um, so the samples we collected during this season, um, cryopreserved preserved on site and then transported back to Nazareth for artificial fertilization trials with females housed uh, at the hatchery. Um, these are just some close-ups of our mobile lab setup. Um, so we had um, sperm processing on the inside with our um, generator-powered microscope. This is where all the sperm analysis took place um, with sperm cryopreservation happening on the truck bed. So there's our wee styrofoam freezing box and all our, um, dry sh um, all our sperm cryopreservation material and then our, our wee dry shipper there for sample storage. And because we had a truck with an open bed, we could safely transport liquid nitrogen um, without having to transport it in the vehicle, which isn't a very good idea. <laughs> um, although at one point the lid did fly off somewhere along the I-20, so we had to fashion a new one. Uh, so we spent the night cryopreserving sperm samples and periodically looking over our shoulder for bears. Um, the proximity of the lab unit to the field site meant that we cut out any travel time and corresponding length of time before sperm analysis to give us a more accurate idea of freshly collected sperm quality parameters and it allowed us to freeze the sperm of the highest quality. So these are our results across all three breeding seasons. Um, we removed the, the males that spermiated prior to hormone injection from analysis. Um, so male response was high, so between 86 and 96% of toads uh, produced sperm across all time points. Uh, concentration was an average between 2.5 to 3.5 million per mil, um, peaking between two to three hours. And sperm motility averaged between 79 to 82%, uh, with a proportion exhibiting forward motility between 52 to 63%. 
So once back at Nazareth, um, we got our females ready for artificial fertilization using the hormone regimen I described earlier. And we converted a trailer unit kindly lent to us by Nazareth into a kind of frog fertility clinic. Um, because again, biosecurity protocols meant we couldn't take sperm samples um, into the facility. Um, so all artificial fertilization was carried out in here with uh, females laying eggs in, inside Nazareth. So we had Natalie inside uh, collecting eggs into dishes and Amanda, our student worker, running back and forth between the facility and our trailer <laughs> with dishes of eggs. And I, I was inside the trailer thawing and analysing the frozen sperm samples to use for artificial uh, fertilisation. So we selected uh, frozen samples from four males to use for artificial fertilisation. Um, which met the criteria of uh, greater than or equal to 70% motility and 40% forward motility with concentrations uh, uh, higher than 1 million per mil. And these were thawed between 72 and 96 hours post-collection in the field. So that was depending on whether the males were collected on day one or day two of field work. The average post-thaw motility was between 22 to 54%. Um, with an average of 5 to 25% exhibiting forward motility. So we monitored early embryonic development at Nazareth, um, where cleavage rates, rates ranged between a very low 1% to a modest 21% until tadpole stage, at which point we had to return to Mississippi. So we drove back down the I-20 with a truckload of <laughs> tubs of tadpoles. Um, and then back at um, Mississippi State, we continued monitoring development um, where a total of 89 um, baby boreals uh, metamorphosed, um, a few of which you can see here in this photo. So although uh, fertilization rates were lower than we expected, um, the fact that we achieved a successful generation of offspring uh, kind of allowed us to validate these methods and hopefully promote the expansion of these techniques as a viable means to secure valuable genetics and enhance the breeding programs of the boreal toad and other threatened species. So I'd just like to end with a, a big shout out to the field crew and the Nazareth staff who were instrumental in making this project happen. And a very big thank you to you all for listening. Um, my email's at the bottom there, and I'm always happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me there, Rose, and I might just have to let you know when I need to change slides, if that's okay, uh, if you can run through your computer. Um, I just guess firstly and quickly here on this slide, I'd like to acknowledge my um, collaborator in all the work I'm about to talk about in um, in New Guinea, in Papua New Guinea, which will make more sense in a moment, um, Dr. Deb Bauer from University of uh, New England. But I'm going to talk about another case study today, and Rose alluded to this earlier, that takes these sort of technologies that um, Rose and, and C have just been talking about to the field, um, probably at the opposite end of the conservation spectrum that we're used to working at. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Rose. So what do I mean by that? So when we think about the way we actually can apply um, arts in conservation, it's the same sorts of problems and dilemmas we have in, in applying any sorts of conservation and mitigation actions in general. And I like to think of it along this sort of spectrum here, where at one end, um, we have this sort of reactive conservation. And unfortunately, this is where we're left at, you know, most of the time in conservation biology. Um, I give an example here in the, the pictures you can see of a program here in Australia in, um, in, in the Alpine regions um, around a very well-known and charismatic corroboree frog, one of the frogs impacted by the amphibian chytrid fungus that swept the world and sent around 500 species crashing to extinction or severe decline. And, you know, vast amounts of money are, are spent on trying to solve this problem and keep it alive. There are about 50 of these frogs left in the wild. Um, that's how bad it's gotten. So a lot of um, the remaining animals left on Earth are, of course, in, in zoos and captive breeding programs. 
And so this is the sort of space we can come into in arts and, and try and manage genetic diversity and things. But unfortunately, reactive conservation, which seems to be the norm in conservation biology, happens usually long after declines have happened. Because of that, the conservation success and chance of success seems to go down because you're left with a lot less animals to start with and it tends to cost a lot more money. At the other end of the conservation spectrum, we can think about proactive conservation. And this is arguably perhaps a bit trickier because it can be really hard sometimes to predict where you're gonna have um, problems in conservation and population declines and extinctions. But if you can predict it, or if you can have enough forward thinking um, to be proactive, you tend to find conservation success goes up because there's less impact to start with. You start with a really good genetically diverse base, lots of animals. And because of all those reasons, it can be a lot cheaper. Now I've given an example here in the picture of um, another Australian example, and that it's nothing to do with arts per se, but it's just the cane toad marching across um, the top of Australia. And if you're unaware for people not in Australia, uh, toads are not native to Australia. So when the cane toad was introduced to control cane beetles in the 1930s, it actually became an invasive pest and it's slowly spreading westward from um, Queensland in the east where it was introduced across the top of Australia westward and wherever it goes because it's toxic and our native predators didn't co-evolve with it they're quite naive to the toxins so things like our, our large monitor lizards crocodiles quolls um, which are all our top order apex predators are so very important in ecosystems uh, eat the toad because it's easy um, to spot and eat and they die and so they crash you know, to, to around sort of 90% population declines or local extirpations. But thinking about that, because an invasive spread of, a, of an amphibian happens in a sort of a wave that's predictable, it moves about 50 kilometres a year across the top of Australia, as that map indicates. If there are conservation actions that could be implemented to solve this problem, well, it's quite predictable. So rather than looking behind the front where population crashes have already occurred, you could think our resources better spent going in front of the invasion front, fencing off key areas, for example, um, teaching native predators how to avoid eating toads through taste aversion and all these sorts of things. So arguably that could be a more effective and, and cheaper way to do conservation. Uh, next slide, thanks Rose. So thinking back into the amphibian um, biodiversity crisis that we seem to be having around the world and the role of arts and in particular in situ arts where this sort of more con proactive conservation might occur. Um, we come back to our example of amphibian chytrids. This is a paper that um, Deb Bauer, who I introduced before and myself published a few years ago in, in science, just sort of plotting and, and talking about the, the unfolding um, chytrid pandemic that's occurring around the world. Chytrids are these fungal diseases, there are now two of them. And this map looks sort of complicated, but don't get too lost into it. But I just want to draw your attention to a couple of points. The first is anything coloured, any shade of green across this world map indicates that it's well known that, that one, one of the two um, invasive chytrids that kills amphibians is there. Um, and you can see around Europe at the moment, there's a, a second species um, that also kills salamander that's now started um, to emerge and, and invade. And this is a real problem. But if we focus there on the second inset panel B, Oceania, down in the bottom right corner, I'll draw your attention just north of Australia there to the island of New Guinea. And that constitutes both um, Papua on the western end, which is part of Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea, which is its own nation to the east. Um, and you can see there that despite this actually being a sampled island, there to date has been no chytra detected. And why this is really significant, if we go to the next slide, is that the island of New Guinea is the world's largest tropical island and thus one of the last places on earth with significant frog um, biodiversity that remains chytrid free. One of the very, very last in the world. Of course, chytrid's not in Antarctica, but it doesn't matter, there's no frogs there. Um, and, and one or two other spots that we think it might not be in, but very, very low frog diversity. But why this is so important in places like New Guinea, well, let's just take the Papua New Guinean side where we've been able to work and we know a bit about the frog fauna. 
Despite New Guinea being less than 1% of the world's land surface, it actually has somewhere between 6 to 8% of the world's frog species on it. That we know of. And if you look at this graph in the bottom right corner, you can actually see this is species, frog species being described um, in New Guinea. And you can see since, you know, around um, the mid uh, 19th century, about 1850, as uh, people started to explore more and scientists went and described frog species, it started to tick up. But then into the 20th century, um, it started to explode and we realised it's incredibly diverse and there's some examples here of a family that's res primarily responsible for this, the microhylid frogs, and you can see some pictures of some there. But in the last um, 10 to 20 years alone, the number of frogs being described is just going through the roof. So there's about 350 species described, I think, just from PNG and into um, Papua now but we think this is probably somewhere only about 50 percent described potentially and we've just got a paper in review at the moment where we've actually worked out that melanesia which is mostly consists of new guinea and a few surrounding islands is actually the most diverse insular frog fauna on earth and fortunately one of the most protected so it has very few threatened species amongst this incredibly diverse frog fauna so an incredibly important overrepresented mega diverse um, place for frogs and as I said, chytrid free. So if we can go to the next slide. Unfortunately, we've also done a bit of work to model what would happen if chytrid arrives. And when I say if, it's probably not a case of if because chytrid has invaded every climatically suitable place on earth, more or less. Um, Madagascar was in a similar place to New Guinea, probably somewhat protected because it's an island. So that island effect stops invasives getting there as quickly and easily. But unfortunately, chytrid has arrived in Madagascar only a small number of years ago, and we're pretty sure New Guinea is going to go the same way. So we did a little bit of modelling based on the examples here in Australia, which are closely related frog fauna. Um, a few of the families occur in, in both places. Um, and, and other techniques. And we estimate from that, that of the roughly 380 species that have already been described, potentially something like 73 would, might be expected to decline significantly or go extinct. Um, and you can see, we've made a bit of a, a map there on the left about which of the families might be most at risk of extinction, thinking about how many species there are and the proportions that, that might head that way. So we have this, potential impending doom on the island of New Guinea. But unlike when chytrid first arrived in the 1970s and 1980s around the rest of the world, this time we're not naive to it. We know about it now and it's predictable. So we're firmly in New Guinea down the end of this proactive conservation spectrum. If we get our, um, if we get our stuff together now and we fund um, you know, this sort of work now, we potentially can do a lot of good by getting in ahead of massive declines when genetic biodiversity is really, really good. We have potential targets for decline and we can actually um, better implement conservation actions and funding. Next slide, Rose. So this is basically the, the case study that I'm gonna just touch on now briefly to finish this with, and that's exactly what we're doing. Um, we've argued since about uh, 2016, 2017, that PNG in particular should be an absolute focus of our efforts, thinking about, um, well, both ex situ strategies or preparing for ex situ strategies where they might be needed, knowing that we have very likely targets in the probably not too distant future. Um, so things like being ready to pull animals into captive breeding programs if needed. And of course, a huge role for arts, because this time around, unlike when chytrid first spread around the world and we were left scrambling, realizing that all of a sudden we couldn't find frog species that were quite abundant and common, all of a sudden they were just gone and then others were, were nearly gone. And so we're left with these genetic bottlenecks and we've lost the diversity already because of course, nobody was um, banking down sperm or saving genomes um, back then, especially of common things, why would you? But here we have a very clear target. And so we argue that we need to now get out. We have these technologies as Rose talked about here in our attempts in Australia with, um, with the bushfire impacts, which of course, again, is being reactive, not, not proactive. And 
and C, talking about going out um, with boreal toads and being able to bank down sperm, again, when they've already lost a lot of um, diversity, we are talking about getting in ahead of this, go and targeting those groups that we've modeled to be most likely to be impacted and being prepared so that when Kitchard arrives and we see very rapid and severe declines and crashes, we are there ready to go and arts having its major impact. Um, this here, I just think is a really nice photo that sums up our very sort of inaugural meeting when we went over to Papua New Guinea we met with um, government officials local landholders we think this is absolutely critical to involve locals we don't want to just be sort of um, that typical westerners floating into a country to do a few things and then leave so it's really important that we're doing this in full collaboration with um, Port Moresby Nature Park there in PNG, the, the PNG government and local landholders and it can be very very challenging working in Papua New Guinea, I can say. Um, so it's not particularly easy. Uh, next slide, Rose. Basically the project goals. Um, well, the first is um, develop PNG's first ex situ frog conservation facility that we're doing in um, collaboration with um, PNG's one and only functioning um, zoo. I guess it's sort of a zoo slash botanic garden in, in Port Moresby Nature Park. Now, this might not sound difficult because, of course, you know, um, we might be, we, we need to be ready for these ex situ strategies um, in the case of sudden crashes where we need to pull in, you know, a few females and to have a breeding colony to be able to reintroduce frozen sperm and that sort of thing to return genetic diversity. You don't want just everything in a bank with no actual live animals if things are crashing rapidly. It sounds like this should be easy, right? Because zoos all around the world breed frogs and, and have these sorts of facilities. But believe it or not, there's never been an institute or facility anywhere in PNG that's ever had the capacity to hold an amphibian. It's very challenging. It's not a particularly wealthy country as um, people are probably quite aware. And, and it can be very, very challenging. Very little resources have been put into places like Papua New Guinea. So the first goal of this was simply to see, can we, can we get basic shipping containers over there and set up with frog tanks? And uh, Zoos Victoria has been a major project partner in this. The second is uh, to work with the students over there, community government and scientists, like I said, and particularly those embedded within PNG and PNG locals to build that arts and, and captive husbandry capacity within country. And that to us is absolutely critical. Um, and then of course, start banking species now before Kitchard arrives. Let's not wait this time around until Kitchard arrives and sends 70 odd species to the brink and then scramble to try and rescue them. Let's get in and bank down that genetic, genetic diversity now so that we have the full gamut of tools ready to go that we prevent this major loss and catastrophic loss of biodiversity and genetic diversity to begin with. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, next slide. Just to touch on the progress and where we're at, of course, this is all progress prior to, to COVID arriving, talking about pandemics of frogs have had theirs and now we've had ours. Um, this has been a major issue in PNG. Uh, they don't have the resources to vaccinate a lot of their population. It's been very challenging. We haven't been able to get back over there for, um, well, basically since the pandemic started, unfortunately. But where we got to prior to that, well, it might not seem a big step to Western countries like Australia, the UK and the US, but it was huge, uh, a huge achievement over in PNG. We have actually set up and have our six, uh, very successful first ever captive frog facility. And yes, we just started with species like uh, white-lipped green tree frogs, which are kind of common and, and other people have kept in other parts of the world. Um, but this has actually worked and there's an educational display now to try and get this education component about um, frog fauna across to people in PNG because of course frogs necess weren't necessarily on the radar and I can also report we've had successful frog breeding within this facility. It's really tricky. You cannot order store-bought crickets to feed your frogs in Papua New Guinea. So everything we had to set from the ground up, including breeding local crickets over there, working out how to do that and things like that. So that's been successful and in full partnership, again, Zoos Victoria uh, teaching local keepers in PNG. Next slide, Rose. And so that's um, where we're at, big tick 
I guess, on, on the first of our project goals. And this is my last slide, um, just to say again, the pandemic COVID hit. Um, but we're now up to the step where we believe um, that we can start to go out with students and community groups and the PNG government and now start to implement some of these technologies that we've developed over here in places like um, Australia and the US and exactly following on from Rose and C's examples earlier. There's no reason that we can't get over there now into New Guinea and start to impart these technologies and the knowledge at least for freezing down and banking sperm. We should be able to go out into wilderness areas now, target the families and species and genera most at risk and start to bank down that material now, get it into that facility that we've set up in PNG and be ready for when, when Kitrit arrives. And as I said, it's not a matter of if, as far as we're concerned, it's a matter of when. And hopefully it holds off long enough that we can actually get some of this material banked and stored. Um, and that is uh, where I'll leave it. Thanks, Simon. Um, so yeah, like Simon said, it's it's following on really nicely from mine and C's talk where we're sort of showing that we can do these things. And now I think it was, it was really important. I'm glad that Simon could join us to get today to show us that um, you know, we can start thinking about using these things before a crisis instead of just afterwards. Yeah, to sum up, like I hope we've showed you that there's a lot of like considerations for in situ biobanking, and um, hopefully we've shown you a little bit about the logistics that you think about um, for going into the field. And there's a whole other layer of um, complexity in Simon's case because you know he's going from Australia to PNG. Like he said, it's very difficult. Um, and even just that example where he said about the crickets is quite like, wow. Um, so once again, if, um, if anybody has any further questions, if we can elaborate on anything, um, here is the email addresses for everybody involved in this talk who've contributed material to the talk. And I hope that it's been a useful background on, on maybe thinking about how to put these things together. It's, it's certainly not the only way to approach things, but it's, it's our experience in how we've approached things.